Thanks uh, everybody for joining us again for another uh, Workshop Wednesday and I just want to make sure that everybody can hear and see what uh, what I'm doing so just um, just type yes if you see a screen and you see uh, should be a disclaimer up there at the moment. Thank you Gabor. Thanks Hans. Uh, thanks Bob. Okay all right let's, uh, let's move forward. So um, this is going to be our uh, probably our last one of the year, our last workshop of the year. Yes, it is. Um, next week, we're not going to be doing the workshop. Um, and you guys should be enjoying Christmas, you know. Get your mind off trading for a day or two. It's, uh, it's healthy. Um, anyway, um, the 26th is Boxing Day in Canada. I'm not sure what you guys call it in the States. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a holiday for us, and uh, we're going to be taking uh, next week's webinar and taking it off. And the second, um, Zach and I haven't quite discussed it yet whether or not we're going to um, run that one either because that's just the day after New Year's. Um, I know you guys, uh, most traders like to sort of get started fresh and early in the year, so uh, we might cater to that. But it sort of depends, I think, on uh, either of our schedules. I don't believe we have uh, anything sort of preventing us from doing that. So. Um, Let's just say for now, unless otherwise uh, notified, uh, we will move ahead with the January 2nd uh, webinar, okay? Um, but uh, it's, it's a maybe right now. So anyway, Zach's going to uh, do some, uh, uh, a little bit of some lessons on 1.1 today, of course, unless you have... Um, uh, some questions and whatnot. Those, of course, take precedence. Um, and Alfred's asking if there's if he looks like you're in San Diego in, uh, uh, today, aren't you, Alfred? Yeah, it's um, it's cold where I am. There's tons of snow, and uh, actually, I was just on the way to the office, and my window just cracked, unfortunately, because I had the defroster on. And I didn't realize that uh, keeping it on so long would would do that. So, looks like I got to replace the windshield, unfortunately. <laughs> Anyways, I digress, but um, let me just open up um, web, our website and show you how to get version 1.1 beta. As you know, we released that as a public beta last week. Um, and uh, on my screen here, you can see, okay, I'm just go back to the home page here. You can see our website. And there's two ways to go about this, okay? If you have logged into our site, um, or you haven't logged into our site, Go ahead and do so, um, because uh, or create, create yourself an account. Because when you do that, um, you can sort of skip this whole angle with um, with having to. Uh, uh, sorry, when you go to this download section here, all right. If you haven't logged in, you won't see. You will not our soft downloads directly here, but if you do log in, which I'll do right now. you'll see that we now have a software releases section in our download link. So again, that's on up here under downloads. Okay, you have to log into our website. Just go to software releases and you can see, actually this is probably misnamed here. This should be beta version now. Um, but this is the release version. This is the beta version that you need. And this file is um, is still experimental, but what this is is a setup file which will essentially get you, um, it, at least at this moment, it will download the alpha version and set it up on your computer without having to use the NinjaTrader kind of um, import script uh, routine. So um, just be aware when you use the setup file. You can, so in other words, I guess what I'm saying is you can use items two or three to get the beta version. Okay, two or three to get the beta version. Just be aware when you hit this this setup here, we, we haven't got our what we call um, certification yet. Uh, so when you do that, you might get this little error saying, hey, this is an unrecognized publisher. Um, okay, I guess I don't at this time, but uh, sometimes you'll get this, um, if, depending on the security of your browser, you might get this thing saying, um, you've got this unrecognized publisher. Um, you know, do you want to execute? Are you sure? In fact, actually, you might be able to download it. I think it's just when you try to execute. Here it is, yeah. So you'll get something like this. In Chrome here, you get this warning. 
Um, and that's again because we haven't got our security certificate yet. Um, but once that's um, once we get that, uh, this will go away. But you just kind of have to kind of know what you're doing and just hit keep. Okay, so don't, don't be alarmed. It's um, still our binary. It's still our code. Um, it's not a virus. <laughs> Uh, you can actually keep it, and it should be okay. But we have we have yet to cert certify that. So that's the only kind of, I guess I'll just say that's just for advanced users that know what you're doing. Um, you're not scared by the little message there. Um, all right. So otherwise, uh, if you don't want to go with that, uh, uh, be bothered with that sort of uh, business, you can just click the alpha version here, which actually should say beta. So I'll change that as soon as this webinar is over. Um, change this or click this, and then you just install it like you have uh, before. Um, the other way to get it, if you couldn't be bothered to log in, is you go to the home button here and you go down to the very bottom under recent news. You'll notice that we have the public beta as a posting here. And uh, if you go there, um, you can see that we've got a small description of um, you know, what, what's included with the, the beta. Uh, there's the download link right here, so you can actually click that. and um, and that's how you download 1.1. And then like, this is not by any means uh, the documentation uh, for 1.1. This is just, again, just a small um, sampling of what we've added uh, in terms of fees and functionality for 1.1. So you can scroll down there and get a better idea of what 1.1 uh, is all about. Um, Zach is going to be sort of showing that off today. Um, so uh, now that you know how to get 1.1 from our website, um, I'm going to uh, pass the mic over to Zach here, and he's going to uh, to give it a shot here and show you 1.1. So, uh, by the way, thanks, Brandon. Randy says the up auto update works just fine for me. Hopefully, that that's the case for you guys too. Um, again, the only uh, it should it's not like the the the, the updater should be broken or anything. That should work just fine. It's just the uh, uh, the browser gets a little freaked out um, again when. Uh, when you download and you try to run it, and that's just because we don't have our security certificate uh, coded in uh, into the, the binary yet. So um, again, just don't be alarmed by this little message. Um, it's just, uh, unfortunately, the browser just can't verify it's from us yet. Uh, and uh, as soon as we get our security certificate, that will change. All right, so let me pass the mic over to Zach here. Zach, you there? All right, thanks, Jeremy. So let me get the projector switched over here. All right, you should see my screen in just a moment while it loads up. <clears throat> All right, yeah, just kind of at the last minute, um, I decided that I guess I should start working with version 1.1 during these workshops. So I, uh, I actually just installed uh, an older version of 1.1 and so I'm going to do some very dangerous on the air here and I'm going to go through the auto update with you guys um, so that way you guys can see see how it works and what to expect uh, and um, first though uh, I wanted to show you something I just found last night on Big Mike's website. Uh, so I know some of you guys have RJ's bars, and a user on Big Mike's uh, just posted um, a version, you know, of these uh, median type Renko bars up there on Big Mike's. So if you're interested in looking at these bars, they're basically now available for free. Um, I have a feeling they don't work exactly the same as RJ's bars. I would like to find somebody that I can um, test this theory with <clears throat> uh, because I'm not sure that I have a feeling that RJ's bars might be modifying historical values. So for example, um, let me get rid of this white moving average. For example, I think RJ's bars, here's another example. Um, I think it would get rid of this this uh, reversal bar and it would just keep showing this uptrend. Because RJ's bars do look really smooth. <clears throat> um, 
and I think you know like this reversal bar here so you get a nice downtrend then you get a reversal bar and it keeps on going I have a feeling that RJ's bars are would would remove this reversal bar and replace it with another downtrend bar but that's just a suspicion I don't know that as a fact I just kind of would like to I would like to find that out so because that, that's pretty critical um, in being able to properly back test you know your system um, knowing how uh, a bar type behaves you know especially these modified bar types um, that are out there so but anyways uh, so big mics this one's for free it's called the uh, I think he called it the ultimate Ranko, and they shorten the name here on the chart to just Uni Ranko. So, um, all right. Well, with that, now let's go through and uh, let's see if Bloodhound will go through its update process. So, if I click on the chart and uh, let's see, no, it didn't. It popped up with the update notice automatically the first time. Um, but I ignored it. So let's see. So let me do a manual update check. All right, so I can go to the help, do a manual update check. And <clears throat> here we go. So it popped up with this message saying there's an available update. And um, I'll hit yes. And this pops up. I'm going to have to keep dragging these things over from my other from my main window. So it's going to get so far. So it's going to download <clears throat> and unzip the package. And now you see it says I have to close NinjaTrader. So let me close up NinjaTrader and save my workspace. Okay, NinjaTrader is closed. Now you can see it finished, and then it's done. And now I just need to restart NinjaTrader. All right. So now I'm just waiting for NinjaTrader to restart. And while NinjaTrader is restarting, I'm going to show you what I have planned uh, to show you guys today. Uh, first, let me see. Randy's got a comment or a question. Let me take a look at this. So, uh, oh, Randy's saying so. He's been using the Uni Ranko for several weeks. Uh, hmm. So you haven't compared it to RJ's. Well, I'd just be curious, Randy. Um, and Kevin has it. So good. I guess you guys have already seen it. I don't. I don't um, check Big Mike's as as much as I used to. So, but I do like sharing these, what I consider neat little tools with you guys. So, and uh, let's see. All right, I'm just waiting for Ninja to load up here, but in the meantime, let me show you what I have planned. So, um, let's see. I shoot. I don't remember who submitted this question. Um, and oh, I'm getting some errors. It looks like, yeah, you know, something that's good to do is to not have charts open with Bloodhound on it, just in case. Um, there's some changes here, but let me just get through these. And um, fortunately, I'm getting some error messages popping up here. And as soon as I get through these, I think everything will be okay. And it's got a few more to click on here. I 
I've got a lot of data, a lot of charts that load up when I load up NinjaTrader. So, because I try and collect GAMI data. So I have a whole workspace dedicated to collecting GAMI data. And it can take a while. Like I said, this was dangerous to do live on the air. <laughs> All right, there we go. Got through it. Um, let me pull up this YouTube video. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, Randy, that was your question. I thought it was, but I wasn't sure, so I didn't mention anything. So, Randy, a pretty active user, submitted the question and um, wanted to know how to implement this system here. Um, and he gave a YouTube link, um, and it's from, let's see, from Steve Primo. Um, his company's on here somewhere. There we go. Um, ProTraderStrategies.com. <clears throat> so, you know, it, it's kind of you know one of the um, you know, one of the big benefits to having Bloodhound is its ability for you to be able to quickly. Um, you know, take some of these, you know, ideas that coaches give you as kind of like the introduction, you know, and to quickly um, build them into Bloodhound, and then you can, you know, within, literally once you get to know Bloodhound in a matter of minutes, um, be able to implement, you know, the system that you're seeing and, and back test it to see, you know, how, you know, how good of a signal is this, you know, is this coach really giving you something worthwhile? or not. Um, and so this is the system we're going to build. And let me kind of jump forward here. Um, and give you the gist of what we're looking at. <clears throat> so let's jump forward a little bit further. Nope. There we go. Okay. So what we're looking to do, this is very similar to the moving average bounce system that I built a couple weeks ago, except that it uses the Don chain indicator and we're looking for a bounce off of the midline. Right? And this midline is uh, it's a form of a moving average of price. Uh, you know, so the first part of the system is, you know, you need to identify a trend. Um, with the Don Chain indicator, right? So you're looking for the lower channel to move up higher, <clears throat> and you're looking for the upper channel to move up higher as well. And then you're looking for price to pull back to this midline, and price needs to touch the midline or break it, but it, it at least has to touch it. <clears throat> and then your entry is going to be on the next bar that breaks the um, the previous bar's high. So this bar here that, that is marked, uh, right, broke the midline. <clears throat> and so we're waiting for the, uh, for a bar to break uh, this bar's high. Uh, and we can see the next bar here doesn't, um, let's see, I can play it. Well, if we look and see what well, um, we turn the audio off. There we go. So now the next bar didn't break the previous bar high. So the next bar sets up a new high that needs to be broken. So basically we're just waiting for the first bar to break the previous bar's high. And let's see. Yeah, it's, it's playing forward. Um, and so here we go. So this bar didn't break the previous bar's high. And so its high becomes the setup. And then obviously this long bar broke its high. And that's your, uh, and that's your entry point. So on this bar. Um, and so that's, that's basically how the system works. Um, so when you're looking at the conditions that are necessary, right, there's two key conditions here. One is, you know, we're looking for, um, 
price to touch the midline or break the midline. And you know, when we say price, always remember you have to think specifically, what do I mean by price? Because when we're dealing with bars like this, there's four prices within this bar. So you always have to ask yourself, which price am I talking about? So in this case, for a long, we're looking for the low to break the midline. And then the second condition is, on the next bar, after, that, after the first condition is met, the following condition is the next bar, the high of that bar, has to break the previous bar's high. Right. So those are the two main, kind of the, kind of the key, um, <clears throat> key conditions that set up the trade. And then there's other conditions which you know, I kind of consider filters. So one of the filters are, you know, you need to uh, you need to be in an uptrend, um, and specifically, you know, you're looking for the lower band to be moving higher and the upper band to be moving higher for a long trade, right? Um, and then we'll find out that kind of another filter that we have to build into is is looking for this pullback in price as well. So that way we don't get signals if price is chopping around like in, like here. So all right with that let me minimize this down. And I saw some comments coming in here, so let me just check these real quick. Um, all right. So Morton is asking, um, you know, Ninja Trader 8 is coming out in 2013, and um, last week's workshop, Morton, um, Jeremy had discussed some of the the new features for Ninja Trader 8. Uh, so Jeremy got to watch the workshop, or yeah, the the webinar um, from Big Mike's, where uh, Raymond discussed some of the the new features in Ninja Trader 8. So. Um, so Martin, we're still waiting for NinjaTrader to release, you know, their early version of eight to us developers. So they haven't done that yet. So you know, my, uh, you know, if you take into what happened to with version seven, it, you know, they kind of, um, uh, it to say it took them an extra, I think nearly an extra year to get NinjaTrader seven out um, than what they kind of planned on. So, um, so you know, when 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 we get our Ninja Trader eight and we start, um, you know, testing Bloodhound with Ninja eight, we'll we'll let you guys know what what kind of our status is. So, but we're still waiting for you know the developer release um, if they even do that. So, so we'll be working on it as soon as we can. So, <clears throat> so you're welcome, Morton. And let's see. So Alfred is saying, uh, "Are you telling me that 1.1 will deliver a, a strategy recalculate or update uh, at my present time?" Um, I'm not sure what you mean, Alfred, by deliver a strategy recalculate. Um, or update. Um, so you know, Bloodhound. You know, the updater will update both Bloodhound and Raven. Um, and essentially, you know, it'll update all the uh, the indicators that come with Bloodhound and Raven as well. If there, are, you know, if there are updates, so it delivers. So the update um, package, you know, delivers the whole package whenever there's an update. Um, that's how Ninja Trader works. So uh, you know, so when there's updates to Bloodhound, you don't just patch it; you deliver a, a whole new package, which just replaces all the components. So, um, <clears throat> so um, let's see. Oh, Jeremy's sending me a message here. So, Alfred, sounds like you're talking something specific to your case and. 
So I would say the answer is no. No, uh, this updater is just going to be for Bloodhound. So if you have special NinjaScript code that implements Bloodhound, um, you know, we, we don't update anybody's custom code. So, um, and let's see, Deb has, let's see, Deb says, so current price just needs to break prior bars high. Correct. Yes, Deb. Let me bring that back up here. So the high, um, the high of the next bar, so this bar had, had closed, and we're waiting for the next bar to build. And so the next bar, the next bar's high has to break the previous bar's high. So. <clears throat> And yes, Deb, it's just uh, just needs to break it. Um, all right, so with that, let's kind of get going here. So I'm going to minimize this one. I actually have another chart here. And oh. Let me bring it down. Here's a little trick. If, you're, uh, if your windows ever pop up out of your monitor's area and you can't grab them to move them, here's a little trick that I learned um, a long time ago. So what you do is um, you go to your taskbar and you right click right on the preview window and you'll, you'll get this move. So you hit the click the move button and then you hit one of the arrow keys on your keyboard so I'm gonna hit the down, the down arrow and you it's kinda of hard to see but my mouse jumped all the way up to the top of the screen you can see it's in a four-sided arrow type icon so I'm gonna hit the down arrow and you see how it popped my window down it popped it down enough so now my mouse is on the title bar and I can click it now and I can drag it. So there's a little tip of the day. So the reason why that happens is because I actually shrink the resolution of this monitor when I do the workshops. Um, just kind of helps minimize the uh, the lag. So um, all right. So uh, as you can see, I have the Don Chain indicator up on my chart, and um, so the next step, let's see, I have Bloodhound on here, but it looks like it, when I did the update, it removed it, so, which is okay. Uh, I was just going to show you the signals, but we'll just start from scratch. So, hmm. I may need to restart NinjaTrader again. So let me take a look and... Add it on here. <clears throat> oh, okay, good. Looks like everything's okay. <clears throat> All right, so the first step I need to do is I need to name my system. And there's two ways you can do that. The easiest way is just to hit this change button. You know, but the change button essentially does the same thing as the save as. You know, but so I need to change the name because there is no name. And um, what I'm going to use is just use a previous um, workshop name, and I'll just change the date and hit save. There we go. Now our system is named. And we can also see there's the name shows up on the button up here. All right. Um, all right. So let's build the first condition, right? As we're looking, let me kind of find a clean 
spot here to work with. Um, and um, all right, here's a clean spot. We'll work with this area. And let me get rid of the uh, opacity here. Okay. So we're looking for, in this case, we're looking for a short here. So we're looking for the high to break the, uh, the midline. All right. So what we're doing is we're comparing price to the midline. So this is a comparison. Uh, you could also um, look at this as a crossover as well. Um, and actually, I think, yeah, I'm going to use the crossover solver instead. I can use both. And I'm going to use, I'll show you why I'm going to use the crossover because it has a nice little handy feature that, uh, that I know will be useful in this condition. Right? So because as, um, as the video showed, um, when, you know, you may not get, um, you may not get into the trade right away, right? It may take several bars before price, you know, moves in the direction that you want before you actually get into the trade. So it may take a couple of bars after the first condition is met, which is, you know, breaking or touching the midline. Um, and so because it may take a few bars, I'm going to use the crossover solver. And let me get this on here and I'll show you why. <clears throat> and let me give this a name. So I'm looking at the, the high and low to the midline crossover. <clears throat> All right, so indicator one or indicator A, the first indicator, is actually going to be price. It's going to be our price. So we're going to be looking at the highs and the lows prices. So, um, uh oh, looks like I will need to restart my Ninja Trader. So let's take a look again. Yep. All right, let me restart Ninja Trader here. So bear with me in a moment. <clears throat> okay, I'm getting Ninja going again. Um, so let's see, let me bring up the video again and we'll play it. Um, and so originally, I think, um, in this video, I think what they say is that you set yourself a, a um, stop limit entry. So when price breaks the high, that gets you into the trade. Um, so, but in this case, um, we're just going to be looking for, you know, the, the current bar is high breaking the previous bar. So, um, yeah, good. I see some comments or questions coming in here. Um, and <clears throat> so Randy's saying, um, but doesn't crossover require the bar to close? 
uh, which could be way too late. Um, yes, Randy, yeah. Well, I, I'm going to build this system, Randy, uh, with, with bar close. Uh, I'm going to build the system, and, and Bloodhound is going to be operating with uh, calculate on bar close. So, um, so the bar, you know, so with that, with calculate on bar set to true, um, calculate on bar close set to true, then the bar always has to close. So, um, and when I get it pulled up. I'll kind of show you some extra, uh, some, I guess, uh, lesser used features of the crossover as well. Because uh, part of the condition is that, uh, let me back this up here. Part of the condition is price just has to touch the midline. It doesn't actually have to um, uh, push through or, you know, break the midline. It just has to touch. And so there's a setting in um, the crossover solver to allow for that as well. So you, so you don't actually have to have a crossover condition. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be looking for these low prices to, oh, there we go. I'm going to be looking for the low prices, looking for these low prices. So if you, if you took a line and connect all the lows, right, we're going to be looking for the low prices to cross the midline or touch the midline. And the same thing with the high prices. So, <clears throat> uh, all right. So let's bring blood down back up here. And Well, shoot. This is not good. It looks like I broke my bloodhound here. Hmm. I think it's because I'm mixing and matching issues. Ah, uh, shoot. All right, hold on a sec. I'm going to close this workspace. So I guess this is another good lesson. So how do you fix it if something goes wrong? So I think what's happening is I've got, uh, got other components, um, not a Bloodhound, but a Falcon that are interfering uh, with Bloodhound here. So I'm going to revert back to... Um, an older version of Bloodhound and see if that fixes my issue. So what I did is I closed up um, the workspace that I used to do these workshops. I closed it up uh, so I don't have any charts open with Bloodhound. And the next what I'm going to do is import um, that earlier version of Bloodhound that I had loaded at the beginning of this workshop. Uh, so let me go find it. Um, and um, I'm sorry you guys are looking at dead air. It looks kind of boring, but uh, don't really want to show <laughs> uh, all this stuff here. So let's see. And all right, so I'm going through the important importing bloodhound again. And Looks like it's going. All right. 
So the old older version of Blowdown imported just fine. So now I have to uh, closing down Ninja Trader and as soon as that closes, I'll restart Ninja Trader and uh, hopefully we should be back on track. Hey Jeremy, if you're still listening, yeah. You have anything anything else to mention while I'm working on getting my Ninja Trader going again? No, yeah. oh, not really. Um, I'm I'm trying to think of what the uh, the update um, uh, messed up, so I'm gonna have to look at your system to see. Um, yeah, it's giving me it gave me some error messages um, regarding Falcon. Yeah, and um, Falcon shouldn't actually. Um, that would indicate you probably are running you were running a debug version earlier, is that right? Or Yes. Uh yeah, you know, that kinda of popped my mind. Yep, right. Remember everything I've got is a debug version. Right. <clears throat> the update would have installed the release version, which doesn't yeah. have any hooks into Falcon, so um hmm. I, I'm telling okay, you well, I'll be back in a second. Yeah, so what I just installed is a debug version of an older debug version of 1.1 so that should fix it then yeah. okay mm -hmm. and uh, I guess just let you guys know um, I'm working on um, updating one of our indicators uh, so we can start doing Fibonacci's here pretty soon so the um, the uh, Dorshans indicator uh, which we renamed SI Swings um, has Fibonacci stuff kind of built into it, but we have to modify it so that it provides um, plot data. You know that Bloodhound can analyze because right now it draws a uh, the Fibonacci um, chart object. Um, right, so we need we need plot data so we can actually analyze. You know the fifty percent. Uh, retracement price value. So I'm working on getting that going. So hopefully in a month, in a month's time, we might be able to get that rolled out. So, <clears throat> and then we also should be working on the divergent stuff as well. All right. So Ninja Trader's up. And now I just need to open up my Bloodhound workspace, and that should be up here shortly. Oh. <clears throat> and this is another thing I need to do. I'm hoping to upgrade my system to an i7, Intel i7. And it'd be nice to get a solid state drive as well. So I've been monitoring the prices of solid states, hoping that they keep coming down. So they've come down quite a bit since last fall or last summer. Right? They were about a dollar a gigabyte, and now they're somewhere between fifty cents and about seventy-five cents a gigabyte. So which is nice, nice for us. So there's i7 and a SSD, boy, all these charts and everything I've got running will just load up in a matter of seconds. <clears throat> all right, no error messages whatsoever. Perfect. And bingo. Okay, we're back on track. All right. Um, let's see. I saw some. There's some comments coming in here. Uh, let me take a quick look at these before I get going. Um, all right, so Deb's asking the question. Uh, for this strategy, how does one set a filter to determine direction? Uh, yeah, so Deb, I'll, I'll cover that. That's a part of this system, right, is determining the direction. And uh, I took a shortcut, and, you know, as we work through this, I'll, I'll, 
I'll explain that to you guys. Um, and let's see. So Randy's saying strategy number one target is the opposite Don Chain channel line. Uh, correct. Yeah. So I wasn't really going to get into that part of the exit. I was just going to get into the entry. Um, right. So that you know you get the entry when you break the previous high, and your exit is when the price hits the uh, the channel, the outer the outer channel. Uh, line, whether it be you know the upper or lower, depending on what direction you're going. So I wasn't really going to get into that, but you know if we got time, I will. Um, so um, all right. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, Asif was asking if it's going to be recorded. Um, he's already left. Uh, yes, all all of these workshops are recorded. So, uh, let's see. Randy's got a bunch of comments here. Um, also, with higher volatility, the Don Chain 21 uh, can be changed to 28, and lower volatility, lower volatility, you can use 14. Um, yeah, you know, Randy brings up a good point. You know, depending, you know, each instrument kind of has its own uh, different volatility, you know, built into the instrument. So one way to kind of handle that volatility um, is you can change the period of your indicator, or you can you can change the period of your bar type. Um, so on this chart, which I can't bring up because I have this selector window open. Uh, but on the CL chart, um, I think it's I think I'm running a tick chart on this. You know, so to get rid of some of the volatility, um, you can you can use a different bar type, uh, or you could use a you know a higher period tick chart. Um, uh, and like Randy said, you can change the period of the Don chain um, of your indicator. So those are good good points. <clears throat> so let's see, Bob's making the comment about my I seven comment there. Let's see. And Randy's making a comment about SSDs. So I guess for those of you who aren't techie, SSDs are the the new solid state hard drives. Um, so basically, they're nothing but pure pure RAM. They run a lot faster. Um, All right. So Deb is asking, uh, how do we how do we know what how do we determine? Um, let's see. How do we determine when to long or short? How is direction determined? Um, okay, Deb. So let me address that here real quick. So um, the way you determine direction is um, the way uh, this gentleman Steve explains it is. You're looking at the channels, and and generally, you know, there's no he doesn't give an exact way, but he says, you know, you're just looking for the channels to be moving up, yeah, right. And so, if if the channels are moving up, then you're looking for a long trade. So you're looking for price to pull back to the midline uh, for a long trade. And of course, if the channels are moving down, then you're looking for a short trade. All right. Okay, so um, it's pretty easy to get sidetracked. So let me um, 
kind of get back to what what we're looking for. Okay. Let me shrink this up a little bit. All right. So what we're looking for, right, is we're looking for the high price. We're looking for the high price so we can see when this high price breaks the midline. Right. I'm using the crossover solver. So indicator A is going to be the high price, and it's also going to be the low price. So let me show you how, how we get this. I get this question a lot. Um, so if we jump down to the SI, shark indicator section here. So we have this indicator called um, SI Chameleon. And what this does, what Chameleon does, um, is it gives you all the price data available from NinjaTrader. All right, so we have the high, the lows, even the mid, the mid line, the open, the close, the typical price, the weighted price, and the median price. So if you're not sure what these prices are, um, if you open up NinjaTrader's help document and you do a search for these, um, you can. Uh, It'll show you, NinjaTrader will show you how they calculate these prices, the mathematical formula for these prices. Um, and one of the uh, other features, the kind of the reason why we called it Chameleon, is because this, this uh, feature that we built in says, says use alternate instrument um, or time frame. And right now it's set to false. If we set it to true, you see this new section opens up and you can choose to use an alternate instrument or a time frame. So if you wanted to, you could go and put a different instrument in here. So that way you have um, price data from another instrument um, being used in, into your Bloodhound system. So, right, so you can see uh, all these other instruments. So this would be ha handy for um, you know for Paris traders, stuff like that, um, you know. Or the other thing is you know you can sh you can use a different um, time period. So you could take like uh, an SMA, and you can nest a different time period into the SMA. Um, all right. So let me turn that feature off. And so for longs. Well, I mean, I'm showing it as a short example here. So for shorts, we're looking for the high to break. So we have that selected here. And for lows, we're going to be looking, I mean, sorry, for longs, we're going to be looking for the lows to break the midline. So I'm using the lows to get a long signal, and I'm losing the, using the highs to get a short signal. So let's click OK. And the next thing is to set indicator B to the midline of the Dawn chain. So let's jump down to the D's and all right, add that indicator. And we're using the 21 period in this case. <clears throat> and I want to compare it, compare the high and low price to the midline. So that's okay. And we can see the crossings have been marked. Um, let's see here. Um, and Just kind of look in here. So, um, so this long here. Let me kind of stretch this out. It'll help. I think this ought to help you guys. All right. So, let me just get this straight in my head again. All right. So we're looking for these low prices to come up. Right. And the low breaks breaks the midline. And then the low drops below, crosses down below the midline, and we get the short 
All right, so this low point here dropped below the midline and we get this short signal. All right, so that's one way to do it. Um, let me kind of show a long example. So for the long, um, right, we have the low prices down here. So the low prices are below the, the midline, and then the low price here jumps up or crosses the midline. And as soon as this low price crosses the midline, we get a long signal. All right. So I think I spoke backwards here, right? I think I said low when I meant high for this short back here. So the highs cross the midline, and then they cross that back down below the midline, and we get a short there. Now, because, because we may not, uh, so let me bring the video back up. So because it may take several bars before, you know, price, breaks the previous bar, you know, we need to extend this crossing signal out, right? So it may not occur on the next, on this, on this, we may not get a signal on this next bar. It's possible. So the reason why I chose the crossover is because I can use this look back period, right? So I can set this look back period to three bars. And so this main signal here where we're looking for, um, price to touch the midline or cross the midline, well now that main condition, you know, its output has been extended forward three bars to give price enough time to kind of do its thing, uh, to give us a signal. So I'm actually going to set this to four bars. Um, and here is another feature that we want, we need to use as well. <clears throat> so um, this accept equal values. So what this does is, um, let's see, you know what, I'm going to switch over to the ES um, because the ES moves in bigger tick sizes. And so it'll show my uh, this example a little better of what I'm wanting to show you. So I'm wanting to show you an example of when price or when the high or the low just touches the midline. All right, and let me kind of change the tick, change the tick size here. Oops, as well. A 256 tick is a pretty fast moving chart. All right, so Let's see if I can find an example where the higher low price just touches the midline. Okay, here's an example. Let me mark it with an arrow right there. So we can see the high came up and touched it, right? And we can see that there's no signal, but that qualifies as, as one of the main conditions. Price just has to touch the midline and then bounce off of it. So let me bring Bloodhound interface back up. Okay, let me open this up. So if I change this, um, let's see, I think, I think we want after. Let me change this to true. And nope. Let me use the before. There we go. Yeah. So when I set before to true, what that's saying is that price, essentially, um, our low just has to touch the midline. So it just has to equal it. It doesn't actually have to cross it. So you don't actually need a true crossover condition, right, to get um, to get a signal out of the solver. Right. And so then it gives us a short. 
and you can see um, here uh, that the short signal stops and the reason why it stops um, let's see I'm trying to make sure I, I have everything straight here um, it stopped yeah because because the high price broke above the midline again so the high price broke above the midline again and that killed and that killed the short um, but for this system I, that that will work out okay all right so let's work on the next component of the system of the signal um, where <clears throat> so we'll kind of work on this bar here let me slide this over and so the next step is we need to have we need to break the low here let me make this a little thicker yeah so we have to break the low of this bar in which we can see this the next bar does break it and so that should give us um, so this should work out pretty good that should give us our next condition um, so for that breaking, um, I'm going to use the comparison solver, right? So I'm going to be comparing. Uh, let me kind of slide this forward. So say this is the current bar. So I'm going to use the comparison solver to compare the current bar's low to the previous bar's low to see if we get this lower, lower low. So we're looking for the current low to be lower than the previous low. So I'm going to use the comparison solver for that. Let's add that on here. So we're going to be looking at the, the high and low to and comparing it to the previous high and low. <clears throat> All right, so once again I need to need to use the SI chameleon indicator. Let's plug this in here. All right, and so for shorts we're looking at the lows. So I need to I want to get a short signal when the lows um, when I'm comparing the lows to each other and I want a long signal I'm going to be comparing the highs to each other for a long signal and I need to switch over indicator B over to SI chameleon as well I just need to change this, change the short signal to use the low price. Now the way, so we're looking at the current bar and we want to compare it to the previous bar. And the way we can do that is we can use this displacement feature. So the displacement feature is kind of a way of looking at <coughs> data, it's a way of looking at data or information one bar back or however many bars back you specify here. So I'm going to put one in there and I need I need price to break I need yeah price to break the previous bar by at least one tick. So I'm going to use this large amount and I need at least one tick of price difference. All right and so now in our output section um, I can see that my shorts I need I need a lower low 
So the current bar, the current bar, that price data is loaded into indicator A. So indicator A is giving me the price data of the current bar. This indicator B section is giving me the price of the previous bar. It's giving me the highs and lows of the previous bar. So another way of saying that is when A, the current bar, is lower or less than the previous bar, that's when I want my signal. All right, so right down here we have um, A is less than B by zero ticks. Let me get that updated here. There we go. Sometimes you can see uh, one of the nice features with 1.1 um, is it takes whatever values you, you put in this large amount and small amount and it transfers them down into the description field down here. So when A, which is the current higher low price, is less than B, which is the previous bar, higher low price by one tick, I want an output. All right, I want a short output. And I need to turn this one off, because this one says by zero ticks, but I need it to break by one tick. And I can go to the longs, and so for the longs, when A is greater than B by one tick, I want a long output. And so I need to take, change this to zero. So let me turn off. I'm going to turn off the crossover solver. And now just show this comparison solver. And so we can see as the highs, as the highs are stepping up, we're getting a long output from this solver. And then as the lows step down, we're getting a short output. All right, so every time the lows get lower, we're getting a short output. And occasionally, you can get both output. Let's see if I can find one of those. Hmm. It's kind of surprising. So if you get an engulfing bar, you'll get, oh, here we go. So this guy right here, you can see we're getting, we're getting a, high, uh, a long output and a short output on this engulfing bar, right? Because the, the high is greater than the previous high and the low is lower than the previous high. All right, so let's turn both both of these on, and there we go. There's our our signal so far on the correct bar, so it's looking good so far. Now we can see that um, this area right here. All right, let me. change that. So we can see we're, we're getting a short here, but clearly we don't want to be getting a short here because we're looking for longs. Um, so let's let's work on let's work on building our, our next condition um, which is when the Don chain indicator is stepping up, we're looking for longs only. And so here Here's where I took uh, a shortcut. I simplified things. So in instead of actually analyzing this lower band and upper band and looking for things to be moving up or moving down, I took a shortcut. And I, uh, I nested the midline into an SMA. And so this um, dashed gray line is an SMA. So you can see I have an SMA and I have the Don chain nested into it. And I kind of just guesstimated and you know thought a 10 period works pretty good. <clears throat> All right. So we can see um, yeah, as as the Don chain begins to step up, uh, right, the midline begins to step up with it. And um, so our SMA begins to move up as well. 
and then as um, this Dawn chain begins to flatten out, the SMA rolls over and it starts rolling down. Um, you know, I, that video doesn't give a lot of details as you know what you kind of do here. Um, you know, so uh, I guess this isn't perfect, but um, maybe we can work on that if we got some time. Actually, I can see I'm kind of running out of time, so let me try and um, get through this move through this a little quicker. All right, so I'm using the 10 SMA of the midline to determine the trend direction. So let me turn those guys off, and we're going to be looking at the slope. All right, so we're looking at the slope of this 10 SMA. So. Um, all right, so it's the SMA 10 of the midline. So let me show you how to do some nesting here. All right, so let me find the SMA. All right, and I want the 10 period. And next... I need to go find the Dawn chain. There we go. And just remember, you don't want to double click on it. Just, and then click the nested input. And I need to set the period correctly, 21. And I want to fit, feed the midline plot into the SMA. All right, so we're good to go. And all right, so this slope solver is the only one on. So when we look at the chart, we can see when the, when that 10 SMA is sloping down, it's giving us shorts, and when it's sloping up, it's giving us long. So, all right, so let's kind of turn all three on and see what happens. Um, great. So it filtered this fault signal out. Um, Let's see, we do have a signal here, you know, and I guess it kind of qualifies. I mean, uh, you know, the Dawn chain is still stepping up. It went flat for a little bit. Price broke the midline here um, and then continued moving up. So I guess te technically that's correct, right? But we can see back here that... Um, Hmm. Well, I guess technically it's correct. I guess technically this guy is correct. Um, you know, I don't really like it. <laughs> I don't like it because of price, this price action, right? Even though the upper band step was stepping down, and by the time we got the signal, you know, well, the band stepped down one bar afterwards, but the midline's been stepping down. But you know what? I don't really like how price was in this upper upper area, the upper half of the Dawn chain. You know, really, I think the um, uh, I think you know the the this, uh, for lack of a better term, the spirit of this system is we're really looking for for pullbacks. You know, we're looking for pullbacks like this right here. Um, let's see, where where's the arrow? A lot. There we go. You know, we're we're really looking for this type of setup here, where price pulls back uh, to the midline. All right. So we didn't. Uh, yeah, we didn't get that on this one. All right. So what? How I chose to kind of fix this condition is. Um, I used an old, I used a filter that um, that I showed when I uh, did the moving average bounce, right? So I have this nine period, uh, zero lag EMA, right? So this is the ZL EMA, and uh, I just used the nine period. It seems to work pretty good. <clears throat> All 
Um, and so what we're looking for, so is when you have this um, zero lag EMA, you can see what it does is, is as price is moving towards the midline, right, you get the slope of the zero line, um, zero lag EMA, you get the slope in the opposite direction. Um, so you're looking for the zero lag EMA to be sloping towards the midline. Um, as kind of a filter type setup um, before price bounces off of it. So let's, um, you know, it would also kind of eliminate this, you know, kind of fishy looking entry, even though it was a good one, but it's going to filter it out, unfortunately. So let's take a look. Uh, this. So let's build the solver that's looking at this. Um, zero lag EMA. So once again that's a slope solver and so it's going to be the slope of the zero lag EMA and it's going to be in the nine period. <clears throat> Let's switch this indicator over. Change the period to the nine period. All right, and now this is only looking at the current bar, right? So we're looking at displacement of zero. And so when I build these kind of filters, um, I like to at least have two bars, if not three bars, <clears throat> of making sure that you know price is moving towards this midline for at least three bars, in which case you'll get, you know, three bars of this moving average, you know, sloping, sloping down for a long. And so for this short, the zero lag EMA would have to be sloping up. So you can see that, you know, we're for longs, we're looking for this SMA to be sloping up. But also for longs, we're looking for the zero lag EMA to be sloping down, All right? So we're looking for a slope in the, but normally in the opposite direction. So we have to reverse our outputs. So let me turn the other solvers off. And so when, when this um, zero lag EMA is sloping down, we actually want a long signal out of this. So we need to reverse the signals here. So instead of looking for an output in direction, we're actually looking for an output against the direction. Oops, put a one in there. So there we go. So that's how we reversed the outputs for the slope. And I want to look for, I'm going to set this up so that we're looking for three bars um, sloping in the right direction. So what I can do is copy this, copy it again, and I'm going to change the name because when I use the displacement feature, I like to uh, I like to put that in the title, so that way you know these don't get confused with each other because they all have the same name. So I would change that to one. And this one will have a displacement of two. And I'll set that to two. All right. And you can see how the output, see how the output changes here? So I have all three of these solvers on. All right. So on the um, on the first bar here where the indicator slopes down, we get um, a third output, and then the next bar over, we get another third for two thirds, and then on the third bar, right, so when three bars occur, that's when we get our signal happening for an output of one. All right. So now let's turn the other guys on. Let's see how this works out. 
and and we can see it doesn't quite work. It doesn't work in this mode. So what we're going to, have to start doing is we're going to have to use um, a logic template. All right, um, just to give a quick explanation. So what, when you're working only in the solver tab, right? So when there's no logic tab defined and you're only working in the solver tab, all of these uh, Bloodhound works uh, and combines all of these solvers together using the ratio node. All right, but we actually need all of these conditions to happen. Um, they all have to be in agreement. So if they all have to be in agreement, if they all have to happen at the same time, then we want to use the AND logic node. So let me um, give this logic template a name. Open this up a little bit. <clears throat> and um, drop the solvers down here. All right, just rearrange these guys. Grab, grab an AND node, and just start plugging them all in. So they all have to occur. They all have to be in agreement. So I'm just going to plug them all in. And there we go. So we get this have, we're just left with this one, you know, nice clean signal. Even though it didn't work, but technically. Um, you know, price was moving up towards the midline, kind of like how we let, how you want it. Um, it filtered this out, and it filtered out this guy. So let's scroll back. Now I kind of noticed that this setup doesn't seem to work too well with the ES. Um, you know, maybe there's a better bar type that it works with. You know, it could be, you know, the tick size is a little too large to work with this, with this setup. And All right, it looks like we should get a signal here on this bar. Let me mark this here. Yeah, it looks like we should. It's, um, hmm. it's kind of hard for me to see where the, where the low is on this guy. So let me, let me turn the session break line off. There, okay. Um, all right, so let's take a look and figure out why we didn't get a signal here. And um, I think I know why. I think it's because um, if you look at the, um, the let's see here, let me kind of shrink this up so it'll, um, let me make an adjustment to this indicator. So auto scale, I'm gonna set that to false. There we go. So I just wanna kinda of expand the Y axis on the chart. So we can see on this bar where we can see the signal should occur, what happens is you can see the uh, zero lag EMA was actually sloping up. So it was sloping in the wrong direction is what happened. Right, so if I disconnect this guy, if I disconnect that solver from the AND node, 
then we'll get a signal there. All right. So what that did is that kind of showed an assumption on my part where I, I sometimes, you know, if you build in too many filters, um, then of course you could, you know, you could, you're going to filter out a lot of the bad trades, but you're also going to filter out some possibly good trades. So let me disconnect that guy and um, hmm. and it's still, let's take a look here. Hmm. Curious. So let's find out what's going on here. So the way you debug your system. Um, is we plug this in one at a time. Um, ah. So I can see my crossover solver is not working in, in every in every case here. Um, yeah, because the low did not cross above the midline. So, okay. Um, hmm. So let's do this. Um, so right now we have the output um, we have the output in direction. All right, so when when this low price crosses up, we're getting a long signal because it's crossing in in the correct direction. So let's set that to zero and let's use this crosses against direction. Set that to one. And bingo. So there we go. That solved it. So as soon as the low price crossed the midline, but also we have it set so as long as it just touches, we'll get a signal. Um, let's just verify that. Let's kind of scroll through the chart, see if I can find a spot where price just touches the midline. And I'm going to scroll kind of fast here, so it's probably not going to look too good on your end. Um, okay, so I think it looks like price is touching the midline there and I'm not getting a signal. So let's work on on this area right here. Let me um, let me mark it here. There we go. All right. So I just had to I had to uh, reverse these except equal values. So if we have after set to true, <clears throat> now, now we're getting a, a crossover signal here occurring. So and you know what? This kind of looks like the ideal setup right here. So we got price moving up, hugging the upper channel, and then pulling back, and then giving us a signal. All right. So let's plug that back in. We're still going to get a good signal and see what happens if we plug this guy in. Oh, it does kill it. Yeah, this solver where we actually need the slope of this um, white moving average, you know, to actually be sloping in the opposite direction of the midline. Yeah, since we had Needing it to be sloping on the current bar may be too much of a, uh, too tight of a filter. So let's use these other ones. 
and we still get the signal. And hmm. All right. Here's so here's another situation that we have to work on. We can see right here. Um, on this short signal. You definitely don't want this short signal. And one thing I can see that what's happening is, you know, price is on the wrong side, the bar, the whole bar is just on the wrong side of the midline. You're right, we know that um, <clears throat> in order to get in order to get a good you know a good signal the closing price is going to be on the correct side of the midline. So let's let's build a filter for that. All right, so what we want to do is compare the closing price to the midline to make sure the closing price is on the right side. All right, so the closing price is going to be above the midline, above the midline for shorts, I mean for longs, I'm sorry. Closing price will be above the midline for longs and it should be below the midline for shorts. So let's go back to the solver tab and add this comparison on there. So we're going to be comparing the close to the midline. And in this case, instead of using SI Chameleon, I'm just going to use our little built-in shortcut here and just look at the closing price. And now, so for indicator B, I need to use the Don chain midline. So let's plug that in there. Let's change the period, and it's already set to the midline. All right. Now, since I have a logic tab, since I I have a logic template in use, uh, unfortunately, I can't use the convenience of turning all these off. So, as you can see, I'm still getting a signal, even though all the solvers are turned off. So, this feature doesn't work anymore because what happens is this result node is what gives us the output on the chart. So, what I can do. <clears throat> You know, so when I'm building a system, I always work in the logic tab only for as long as I can. And then when I think I have all my solvers set up correctly, you know, uh, giving me the correct outputs that I want, then that's when I start, that's, that's when I start using the logic tab. Um, so now if I need to test uh, a new solver, I just have to plug it directly into the result node, make sure it's working. So, yep, as we can see, the closing price gets above the midline, and it's giving us a long output. So, good. <clears throat> let's take this, we'll plug it in down there, and all right, it filtered this guy out. So let's take a look at some of these. Um, yeah, so this looks like this qualified for a good short setup. Um, this one as well. And let's see this long. Um, mm -hmm. Looks like I'm missing some data here. Um, but in any case, we can see Price is moving up, and then it kind of slowly drifted back down to the midline, and then popped up. So that looks like a valid um, long entry. Price price action looks a little questionable, but let me jump back to current. All right. Um, hmm. All right, so we're getting a, 
Um, we're getting this long here, which we clearly don't want this long, so this doesn't qualify. Let's try and figure out what's going on here. Um, you know, my first question is when I'm looking at the slope of these um, of the white moving average, it looks kind of flat to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at these guys one at a time. And first, let me mark let me mark this on the chart here. Okay, so we got the bar marked and so we'll connect this leader up and take a look at just this one one solver. And that one solver says that the slope is hmm. so I guess the zero um hmm. Yeah, so I guess the slope on this zero lag EMA is just barely slightly down, even though we can't really see it. All right. So what that is telling me then is that I do need to require some kind of a minimum amount of slope on this. So let's put a, a, a slope value in there. All right, good. So that should kill the signal. And I'm going to do the same thing. There. All right. And now let's see. All right, good. So that got rid of this long signal. So what I had to do is just, you know, um, put in at least a minimal amount of required slope, uh, you know, as one of my filters. Okay, so let's scroll through here. And... Yeah, this doesn't really qualify for a long setup, you know, because the Don chain is not really moving up. If anything, it looks like it's starting to step down. So that didn't qualify for a long. And unfortunately, um, mm -hmm, hmm. well, luckily. You know, I would say according to the system rules, um, you know, the low price did break this previous low here. So technically, you would have gotten into the trade, but then got stopped out. But because we added this filter that requires the closing price to be below the midline, right, that filtered out this signal. So that ended up being a, an extra... Uh, kind of a bonus there, a nice extra. All right, doesn't look like anything kind of qualifies there. Um, and hmm, luckily price didn't come down and touch the midline. Otherwise, we would have gotten a long signal there. Um, yep, yeah, so this guy qualified still. Um, too bad that didn't turn out to be a good trade. But the signal looks correct. Price moved up to the midline. And then we got a close below, below the bars low. All right. Hmm. Um, let me switch over to different instrument. Maybe we'll get. Maybe the system works better on currencies or something like that. 
So we'll switch over to the 6E. That ES is quite a different animal. <clears throat> you know, to me this looks like a good, a valid short according to the rules, even though it didn't quite work out, but that does look like a valid short. Um, let's see. I'm thinking this guy looks like a val looks like looks like a valid short entry. Um, hmm. Let's see why this didn't why why this didn't signal short right here. Um, let's pull up the interface. All right, and what I can do is just start plugging the solvers in. Mm hmm. Hmm. Mm, there we go. So when I change the output of this crossover solver to include indirection, because we can see, so well, let me set this back to zero. All right, so right now we're using the against direction. And let me open this up. Make this a little wider so we can actually read read the full description here. So we're using the uh, crosses against direction, set to one. So as soon as the high price broke the midline, right, we got the short. But then the high price broke down below the midline, and it killed the signal. So what I did is I just used the cross in direction. So in direction means so when we when when we get a crossing down, we also want a short. So when I turn that on, then we got our our signal from the crossover. And so that fixed it. So let's take a look. All right. Good. There. All right. So the moral of the story is don't expect to get your everything done perfectly. It does, you know, take a little bit looking through it, um, you know, uh, finding, you know, finding some uh, some uh, kind of bugs in your logic, or not bugs, but, you know, missing, um, missing information in your system, and then just kind of tweaking it until you get it set right. I'll just delete that guy. Just clean this, clean this up a little bit. All right. This long signal to me looks well. It probably doesn't quite qualify because the lower band of the dot chain really isn't stepping up, even though the midline was stepping up and uh, the upper band did. Yeah, it's kind of questionable. Um, turned out okay. So, this short um, looked good, technically still qualified. All right. Let's scroll back here and look for some more signals here. Mm.
Hmm. So let's see what happened here. Let's see what happened here on this guy. Um, well, we didn't break the previous bar's high, but we did on this bar, so we should get a signal on this bar here. So let's see what happened. Um, let's take a look at this. All right. So the crossover solver is giving us a long. And this solver, which is looking for the high to break the previous high, gave us a long. And we know the slope. We can look at the indicator. The slope of the 10 SMA is correct. So let's see if this. Um, so that's what happens. So the zero lag EMA um, hmm, didn't work out. Didn't work out in this case. Mm hmm. So let's see what happens if we lower the slope a little bit. Still nothing. So if we go to zero ticks, yeah. So if the slope is really low. Keep inching the, the slope amount up. Until I find it works. Until I find that cutoff point. Um, all right, so point zero four. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, all right. So once again, we you know we're still fine tuning this system. So now we got that long. And let's see. Does this look? Um, well, I'm just kind of looking at the Don chain and. Oops, let me go back here. Hmm. Yeah, the Don chain looks kind of flat, and our 10 SMA looks a little flat as well. So maybe we need to, you know, put some kind of minimum slope on this 10 SMA as well. So that way we're not taking trades when price is just chopping around here. Um, you know, sometimes it works out, you know, like this This short worked out okay. This long didn't work out, and this short, yeah, I wouldn't really say this short worked out. We could have got a couple of ticks, but, um, you know, but I think, you know, the way this system is described by Steve Primo, you know, I don't think we should be taking trades in here. So, and I can see, you know, I'm looking at the gray, <clears throat> um, looking at the gray SMA line. I can see here, it looks really flat for this short. It looks like we'd still get a long signal just because of that. Um, let's take a look and let's put you know, some kind of minimum slope value in there. Oops, I'm modifying the wrong solver. Let me put that back. 
there we go. We want to modify this one. That's why my results were not changing. <laughs> All right. Let's put a slope in there. Okay, good. So I can see, so now when this gray SMA line looks flat in here, we're not getting it out. There's no output from that solver. Let's take a look here. All right, so we got rid of this short. It didn't get rid of this long. So, um, hmm. you know, we could get into some more advanced log logic and um, analyze these channel lines. Um, you know, so we'll, and, you know, maybe if we do do that, actually this short might might have qualified because the upper band is moving moved down and this lower band moved down. You know, so I guess technically you could say this short did qualify. Um, and this long, though, yeah, I wouldn't really say this long qualified, you know, in the spirit of the signal because the lower band definitely hasn't um, been moving up. You know, we just had this sh short two bars of this upper band moving back up. You know, so maybe if, you know, if we did some advanced logic, we could analyze the upper and lower band um, to try and uh, filter out this long. However, uh, for today's session, it's 12.20, so I need to wrap it up. Um, and um, so... Maybe after Christmas, we can come back and revisit this um, and get into some advanced logic. So, um, yeah. Let me try and get through some of these comments I saw coming in. I'm sorry I didn't get to them. I was just trying to wrap this up uh, before it got too late. So, all right. So, Alfred had to leave us. He said, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Alfred, and everybody else. And um, all right, just kind of trying to get through some of these comments here. See if there's any questions. Uh, okay. Um, Yeah, so Bob's is making some comments about the solid state drives. They're definitely faster, um, a lot faster. Um, um, so Deb is asking, well, it looks like good Jeremy uh, answered the question for Deb. She's asking, so how do we define trend in Bloodhound? Um, you know, I showed a very simple way to just looking at a moving average, right? That's what um, that's what a lot of people, you know, a lot of traders do is they just use a, a moving average to kind of define their trend. Um, you know, uh, some more advanced traders will use multiple higher time frames um, as well to kind of define trends. So they'll put a moving average on a higher time frames. You know, so that's a simple way. You know, really, Deb, it's up to you. Whatever indicator you want to use to define trend, you know, we're not we're not telling you what to do. We're not teaching you how to trade. Um, you know, we're teaching you to, how to use Bloodhound to take your knowledge and implement it into Bloodhound because uh, there's lots of different ways to define trend. Oh. Um, Let's see. Mm, all right. Yeah, so Rand is making the comment that the auto updater worked fine for him, and you know it's always worked fine for me. But uh, in this class, what happened was I automatically downloaded the non-debug version, and so it looked like it clashed with um, so the debug version of Blood of Falcon that I have. Uh, all right. Randy's throwing out some questions. One of these days, we're going to have Randy teach a class. He's good at catching my mistakes. <laughs> so, uh, 
Um, all right. Let's see. All right, good. So it looks like I taught Randy something new about the crossover in today's session. Um, Hmm. Oh, Kevin wanted me to cover how I nested the 10 SMA, but he's left already. Sorry about that, Kevin. Um, there's some earlier workshops. Um, I know there's some, I think, in this description. <clears throat> um, where I use uh, SI Chameleon um, in some of the previous workshops. You know, so that if you need to look to see how to use nesting, um, there's definitely some examples in, in uh, earlier workshops. But uh, I guess that would be a good, a good short one to add to our tutorial section. All right. Yeah, so Randy made a good suggestion um, here. Kind of ran out of time, but you know, I'm, I'm using the, these two solvers here. Um, are looking at, you know, are looking at the zero line, this white moving average, and um, you know, I could plug both of these into the OR node. So that at least I'm looking for at least one bar or two bars of you know, this zero lag sloping in the right direction. <clears throat> and so if we do get one bar that kind of flattens out, um, or if we get an extreme price movement, you know, the slope changes in the wrong direction, that wouldn't kill the signal. You know, so I could join these two conditions using an OR node. Um, so that's a good suggestion, Randy. Um, All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Good, Deb. I'm I'm glad that uh, kind of showed you how you can you know work on debugging your system works good. Um, you know, if you look at some of the other workshops, you'll see you know there's other ways of doing it. Like you can use this color plot as well. If I turn this color plot on white, right? You see the white line now on the bottom, so you can see exactly what that solver is doing. So that's another method. And um, let's see. And shoot, Kurt has left, but he asked, uh, what's the difference uh, with the paid version versus the trial version? So maybe there's some other, um, other questions, uh, other people interested. So the, um, the paid version, well, I mean, start with the, the trial version, um, allows you to back test up to 60 days of intraday data. Right, so I'm using intraday data. Um, oops, put that back. And so you can back test up to 60 days of intraday data. If you're testing on daily charts, then I think you can back test um, up to. Uh, let's see what is up to one year, I think. Um, I don't remember exactly, but um, and. Also, um, you have to, let's see, also, um, let me bring up the control center. And also, the trial version only works in global simulation mode. All right, so those are the two restrictions, is the amount of data you can backtest on, and you have to be in global, global simulation mode as well. 
that's the only difference between the paid version and the trial version. All right. Um, and so, all right, so Deb, I did skip this. Normally I cover this in the beginning of the class. Um, so Deb is wanting to know where she can find the recording. And let me close this up. So um, give Jeremy a, a couple days to um, get these recordings posted. So if you go to Bloodhound, then go down to Learn Bloodhound, and then you can see the training workshops are down here near the bottom. Click on that, and here's the most recent eight that show here in this quick list. And if you click on Recorded Webinars, then you can look through all of the archives. So um, they're sorted by, by date here, by month. Um, if you just kind of like want a quicker look, then you can jump on our YouTube channel. So if you just start one of these videos, click on the YouTube icon there, and it'll open up. Uh, okay, good. That didn't start. And it'll open up our YouTube channel. So all of our recordings are hosted by YouTube. And you can just go through and scan through all the workshops there. So, all right. Um, uh, all right, good. So Theo had the same question. All right, guys. Well, thanks for joining us today. And I'm going to end it with that. And I'll just check to see if Jeremy has any, has any last words. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. I see. Jeremy sent me a message. Looked like he had to step out um, for a moment. So I just want to remind you that we do have a um, Christmas sale going on. Um, it's $200 off. And so if you purchase now, there's no coupon required. Uh, just if you purchase now, you'll get $200 off the price. Mm -hmm. And that is going until the end of this month, I believe. Yeah. So that's our Christmas sale for you guys. All right, guys. Uh, I'm going to sign off there. And thanks for joining us. And you guys have a, a great Christmas holiday. And enjoy your time with family and friends and whoever makes your Christmas fun. All right, guys. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.